All right. Hello and welcome back to another jam-packed episode of the Hammercast. I am your host, Alex, the Hebrew Hammer Salkin. And joining me once again is the man, the riff, the legend, Mark Rifkind. And we're going to be talking about training and gaining as a boomer. And uh, one of the things that I think I almost hesitate to say boomer because it's sort of like been turned into a pejorative. I don't think it is. It's just, you know, I embrace it, man. I love yeah, it. I, I, I am. I, I am what I am. So I, I boomer away. Yeah. Well, and it's it's funny because it's like certain certain uh, uh, generations names have been sort of turned into uh, pejoratives. There's boomer and then like millennial. Nobody ever cared about calling talking trash about Gen X. They were like, oh, you guys are fine, you know, but uh, it's kind of like um what was the movie uh, half baked? Like f you, f you, you're cool, f you. That's basically yeah, exactly. millennials and and boomers get lumped into the f you category. But we're going to be talking a good deal about, uh, as I mentioned, training and gaining as a boomer. And I think it's something that's important in particular because, you know, as we get older, even you know pre boomer uh, age range, we start to build up some mileage, and it's important to know how to train around it, how to train through it, but most importantly, how to train intelligently. And uh, it's going to be a very good conversation because uh, Mark is a, a wealth of information on all this stuff. And I also want to point out to listeners, if this is your first time or maybe your millionth time listening to one of my episodes, if you have not already gotten my nine minute kettlebell and body weight challenge, you should definitely do that. It is totally free. All you have to do is go to nine minute challenge dot com, get your own free copy. But it's based around what I think is probably the most important of all human movement patterns, which is the gait pattern and how to strengthen it so that you can apply the strength that you get from this most unique of movement patterns into all other things that you do. And the moves in there are super simple. It takes like 30 seconds a piece to learn. So go to 9minutechallenge.com and get your own free copy. Oh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that it's it's made to be done in conjunction with your regular training, not separate from it. So you don't have to put aside your regular workouts, especially if you're really enjoying them. This should be something that you treat as kind of like a We'll say like uh, uh, a booster for your training, kind of like if you were to add a NOS booster to your car. I don't know. I'm not a car guy. I don't know anything about analogies relating to cars. I just imagine like the movies where they're like, oh, I'm going to put this in the engine. All of a sudden, you know, my SPD. Honda. Yeah, exactly. My yours. Honda goes a thousand miles an hour. Uh, so 9minutechallenge.com and it is all yours. So uh, without further ado, Mark, welcome back to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Alex. I was really looking forward to it. I always have a good time speaking with you and it's it's good. So um, I'm really happy to be back here. And I, the topic's near and dear to my heart. Obviously, I'm going to be 67 in two months. So um, definitely not young. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, you train you train as though you were because you have such incredible, uh, you've made such incredible progress over the last few years. You know, I remember sometime back, you talked about how um, you kind of intuited many years ago that uh, everything's going online. So why not put my training journal online and just you know, rather than writing it in a journal that only I can right. see, I'll put it out where everybody else can see it. And that was kind of the the uh, the beginning of of Riff's blog. And I've been following the stuff that you do on with your military press training in particular. And it's incredible to see, as you said, you're you're closing in on sixty seven years old, and you're able to military yeah. press over two hundred pounds. Let's, let's be let me be honest about that. I don't call it a military press because it's funky. It's it's a standing press. It's a standing overhead press. <laughs> Um, it's, it's definitely not strict. It's definitely, it's my variation given to the, the variety of injuries that I have and the adjustments I've had to make, which is part and parcel of what we'll talk about and make, making indiv individuating, you know, your techniques and things like that. So I don't want people to, you know, look at my press and go, Oh, that's a standing bench press. It's like, okay, I own it. It's a standing bench press. Knock yourself out, train it like me, see how you do. Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, so yeah, it's like, it's, it's been, I've been doing that for now nine years training that I really started that after my knee replacement. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was, um, that was really, you know, and it's still making progress in the swings and, and all the stuff. And that's a part and parcel of, of what's going on. Excuse me a second. Hun, Tracy, I can hear you. Thank you. My wife's talking. It's like, she's got the ear pods on, so I don't exist. Yeah. My, my wife, Tracy, I said, Tracy, after I said Tracy, see, this is what married life is, right? Yes, so I look forward to yelling it. at each other from several rooms, going, "What? What? What'd you say?" 
I'm sure too, as you as you reach your 60s, it probably the numbers of the number of what's probably increases <laughs> like a certain amount every year. Well, AirPods doesn't help because like people have those things in and like you know they're not listening. So anyhow, it's like yeah, the the blog. This next um, it's 19 years old. It'll be 20 years I've been writing that. I mean, I've been keeping blogs for you know journals for 40 years. Yeah. yeah so I put it online and you know it's it's um, I don't know anybody actually reads it, but I it's a OCD thing now. I just write it down. So. But yeah, things have gotten much better. I mean, it was a slog for a long time, just kind of climbing out of that hole after my knee replacement and mm -hmm. building back up. But yeah, you know, just that's part of the whole strategy that I have for me and for my clients and for older people. Um, so we can dive right into that whole strategy if you want, how we want to start talking about that. Certainly. Well, you know, the first thing that I think uh, is is good that you pointed out was how your, we'll call it overhead press training is, uh, has uh, how long number one how long you've been doing it number two how far you've gone but number three that you've made it something that you are able to train regularly and safely because i think one of the problems that i see a lot with well-meaning but let's say maybe new jack kind of trainers mm -hmm. they see like okay this is the standard all right mm -hmm. ergo everybody has to do it exactly like this when in reality uh they don't understand how to use the principles of the technique in question to make it something that is uh, proper for their students. So what ends up happening is they're trying to jam a round peg into a square hole and sometimes they get tweaked. Sometimes. Well, that's that. So it happened with me when I was doing, I mean, I literally had to stop doing kettlebell presses because I was trying to train the, the kettlebell press according to the, you know, the, the kettlebell standard at the time, which did not fit my shoulder at all. I mean, I ended up constantly having bicep impingement because it was a technique that just didn't fit me. And I felt like I had to do it that way. I mean, everything I've, I do with my swings and you know, I wear Olympic shoes when I swing, I mean, everything I've done has never been standard because, you know, I was injured when I was 17. So everything, mm -hmm. and then really, and then my shoulder when I was 22. So I had to make adjustments and you have to be able to go against uh, the grain if you want to survive. Essentially, if you keep, you know, keep getting injured, you keep doing the same thing and it keeps hurting you you better make a change or else you're, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I, I read now on, on Facebook and social media. It's like guys, my age and, and younger, like the shoulders are jacked up and their, their backs jacked up and their knees are jacked up and they don't have a strategy to work around it. I'm still able to do the things I want to do because I adjusted either technique or body work or all these things or volume or intensity, blah, blah, blah mm -hmm. for me. And I'm, I've just let go of the need to try to conform to, like you just said, that standard. that's why I said, I don't call it a military press. I don't call it a whatever, you know, I get a lot of grief from my back arch. I mean, I don't know how many times, you know, for the last 10 years I've been doing it, I actually turned off my comments on my YouTube channel because people would just yell at me all the time. I was like, okay, I'm not asking for your advice. So like, you're, you're going to break your back. And it's like, you told me that I've been doing this twice a week for the last 10 years. Yeah. My back's better than ever. So you might shut up by this time. But yeah. they, so I just turn off my comments. Yeah. So I, that's the thing with social media, by the way, is that it's like, I real I don't want to go into a huge tangent about this, but I do want to bring this up because you mentioned social media comments and it's crazy how stupid people are. And I, you know, like <laughs> George Carlin once said, think of how stupid the average person is and now realize <laughs> half of them are even dumber. And I remember I, I thought like, yeah. that's a little uncharitable, but lately I really have tried to avoid getting into arguments with people online, but you realize like, oh my God, the, like, these people no, really it's, are it's, just it's dumb. A, it's a stereotype because it's true. Yeah, it's crazy. And then, of course, you know, the empty can rattles the most. It's like the people who are out there putting the most comments out there on things they know nothing about. It's like all it takes is you peel back one layer and it like it, they've got nothing. They're just dumb. Yeah. And it's the exercise world is exactly like that because you get somebody who's just started powerlifting and now everything is, oh, well, if you're not doing five, three, one, or if you're not doing five by five, or you're not doing strong, they're, they're, you're an idiot. Knowledge of history goes back five or six minutes, right? Yes. You know, history started with five, three, one. I mean, that's, yeah. Like what, you know, my five rules that I wrote for Pavel, like we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. If you don't know who the giants are and you haven't studied what the giants did, who, by the way, had no social media, no information, no double blind studies, nothing to go on, but instinct and, and results, right? Instinct yeah. and results. Results are everything. Yeah. That's one of the things that, you know, um, Strong First was always about. And unfortunately, they've gotten away from a lot is that, you know, reverse engineering what the best do naturally, which mm -hmm. always means you're going to have some idiosyncrasy in there. Right. 
Yeah. Because the best do their own thing. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't make it, you know, over somebody else's technique. They invent their own or they modify it because really at the end result is the end result. That's what matters. Yeah. Is it good? Yes. If it isn't, change it, throw it out. I mean, I can't, you know, if you followed my press training, how many times have I changed technique? And most people don't even notice because it's really so subtle. I don't even bother talking about it anymore. But it's completely different. I just did it again. But it's like, I don't care. Like, all I'm interested in is getting going forward. If it's not going forward and it doesn't injure me, I'm good. If it injure me, even if it's a good technique, it gets thrown. Yeah. It reminds me of a story I heard many years ago that, um, and I don't know who the character is in the story, but it was there was like a kung fu guy who, I think it was, it might have been Ip Man. I could be wrong. But basically, the story was that like, he would study super hard by himself because, you know, his dad didn't want to pay for lessons or he would watch his brother's lessons. He would like hide in the bushes, watch as his brother took these Kung Fu lessons or it was something along these lines. Eventually he went and he, he sparred with some other Kung Fu guys and he like wailed on all of them. Whereas previously they all wailed on him. So they accused him of learning a different style. And I remember the first thing I thought of was like, well, if he just beat you, what difference does it make? Right, like, exactly. if, if your style you didn't wasn't to the right style, you still beat me. Like, maybe we should be studying your style. Exactly. And so, unfortunately, that's what I see with a lot of people who they get focused. This is a, again a Bruce Lee line, but he said, and I think it was "Enter the Dragon." I almost wanted to call it "Enter the Kettlebell." I'm just so used to saying yeah, exactly. "Enter the Kettlebell." Um, but he chastises a student for focusing on his finger when he's pointing, and he said, "You want to focus on the moon." not the finger, because if you're focusing on the finger, you're going to miss the moon, i.e. the target. Right. right. And so a lot of people focus more on the path, which is important, but mm -hmm. without keeping an eye on where exactly it is they're supposed to be going. Well, a lot of it just depends on, you know, are you a ranked beginner? Are you a beginner beginner? Are you an intermediate or mm -hmm. intermediate advanced or advanced or you're an expert? At what level? I mean, everybody assumes that everybody's at one stage, like mm -hmm. programs are written as if everybody's one stage with any kind of, you know, you're your chronic chronological age, your physiological age, your ex, your training age. I mean, there's so many different variables. And the thing is, we're never the same. Every second, we're older. Every second, the whole body's changing. So you mm -hmm. have to be paying attention. So, yeah. yeah. So if you want to go like, you sent me some questions. I think they're really good questions. It's like yeah. the key physical and health issues boomers face. Yeah, I definitely want to get into that. I want to make one um note about one of the things that you just said I had something came to mind that seemed profound enough to uh to talk more about I, it'll come to me but i do want to talk about that in particular because you know you've been training for a very long time you've trained through some pretty tough injuries and most importantly you've helped a lot of other boomers to just see some really amazing results and you know, I think people intuit that, okay, when you're older, you have to train a little differently. And some of them go completely the wrong direction. They're like, time to hang up my spurs and I'll just do Pilates or something, you know, totally mm -hmm. weak sauce. But you have people lifting weights and getting stronger than mm -hmm. ever. So, but, you know, one of the things that people have to keep in mind is, let's say in your late 50s, 60s, 70s, um, there, there are certain things that are maybe going to be ill-advised and maybe you have to work a little harder toward them. But more specifically, there are probably some commonalities in terms of issues that people in the, the boomer age category face. So what are some of these, like, let's say, um, the more common health and uh, physical issues that boomers face as they age and how do you address them with the training? Yeah, that's a great good question. But first you have to look at, <clears throat> is this boomer? Is this somebody who's been training all their life and now is, you know, having to try to deal with hanging on to older techniques, um, not techniques, but older qualities and abilities? Or is this mm -hmm. somebody who just told their doctor said, you got to start exercising or you're going to die earlier. So that's a big difference. You know, you have, have somebody that's been um, an athlete all their life, somebody that was an athlete, then went sedentary. So everything is, it has to be individualized, right? So if I have a new client and somebody tells me, okay, well, I was an athlete in high school. It's like full stop. Great. I know who you are now. Mm -hmm. You may not have trained for 30 years, but you were an athlete during the developmental years, you know, during high school, whatever, early college. I know you're going to be in a different level than somebody that's like, listen, you know, I've never done anything physical in my life. It's a, it's literally a completely different approach. Mm -hmm. So, and then you have the people, you know, you get the heart chargers. 
somebody that says, okay, you know, I've been an athlete. I was an athlete. I, I haven't, I took some time off. I want to go back, but I want to, I want challenges. I want to have these, I want to hit these numbers or I want to hit these lifts or I want to compete in this sport or I want to do this. I want to be competitive. I want to be aggressive or somebody's just like, basically I'm trying to, you know, go into my older years and not be hurt and still main, pick up my grandkids and play on the floor mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So that, those are very different needs and requirements in terms of, you know, what I'm going to prescribe for somebody, right? So mm -hmm. everything that I do with any client at any age, all revolves because like everything I do is principle based. Because mm -hmm. if you have the principle, the meth, the methods are easy once you have the principles. If you don't have the me methods are nothing. Programs are, you know, nothing. I mean, anybody can write any program. It's like, can you do it? You know, I had one guy came up to me and we're talking about the, a friend of mine's program. It's like, he's like, oh man, this program is unbelievable. It's awesome. I said, great. I said, what kind of gains did you get? So I couldn't do it. I couldn't finish it. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, that's the thing. It's like yeah, the program has to be tailored to you, your needs. Yeah. You know, it's like, and your goals, like you have most, you know, most people my age and younger, even if they were athletes, I mean, even for me, like I have no interest in. Um, challenging myself at a point, testing myself anymore. I mean, I test myself with my press because I feel it's safe, mm -hmm. you know, and it harkens back. I mean, I have really good natural pressing ability. I always have from gymnastics, blah, 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 bench press. It just, it's a natural thing for me. And once I figured out how to do my, my standing press in a method that doesn't jack my shoulders up, then it became a different game. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but most people, I think, you know, the biggest mistake I see with boomers, besides playing pickleball, which should be against the law for for boomers or anybody. Yeah. It's just one of those things that's like Pavel and Pilates. It's like, don't do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, one of the reasons is pickleball is like the new orthopedic surgeons CrossFit, right? Yeah. CrossFit died off. And now like Tracy started playing pickleball a couple of years ago before we got the dogs. And she like the first month she was there, she had like four people tore Achilles tendons and it's constant. People, one of my clients, 57-year-old son, um, tore completely avulsed all four quad tendons playing pickleball. And now, this is a guy who is a, an accomplished, lifelong tennis player. Anyhow, so if people, you know, things will break. One of the things that happens when you get older, regardless of, you know, ability or, or a desire or approach, is, you know, miles add up, right? And even if you don't train hard, age accumulates your the the tissues gets grittier you know the collagen and the elastin decreases the the flexibility pliability of the tissues that's one of the reasons i one of the big things i hearken on a body maintenance is is tissue quality mm -hmm. you know if the what's your tissue quality is it is it soft tissue supposed to be soft <clears throat> that's a hint you know if your soft tissue isn't soft <clears throat> excuse me that's an indicator right soft tissue is not soft the connective tissue is probably not soft things will break yeah so it's like as you get older it's like if you want to push those limits i'm fine with that i push limits all the time be prepared for things to go south yeah and don't complain when they do if you want to see what your you know what the, the top end is up the next step off the peak right it's always down so when yeah. you fall off the peak and you enjoy the ride at the top and I understand because I do it, I do it a lot, but I'm now I'm very careful, as careful as I can be. And anything that it gives me the slight hint, it's going to hurt me. I back right off right? because I'm tired of being hurt. So for older people, like I said, the principal base is like everybody has to maintain basic uh, primal patterns. Yeah. You know, so squatting, lunging, hinging, pushing, pulling and gait, bending and gait. Right. So seven primal patterns. Now, some of those patterns you can load. Some of those patterns you don't need to load. You just need to maintain. Like for me, I don't load my squat pattern anymore. I don't want my back's too fragile. I have a mm -hmm. replaced knee, but I squat every week and I squat every day with body weight. Yeah. So I do a really light, I do belt squats and it's very light, but it's it strengthens that pattern in a way that doesn't hurt anything. Right. But I'm not, I mean, could I barbell squat? Absolutely. Do I want to take that risk? Absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's not worth the risk. So it's always a risk reward ratio. Like yeah. does the reward give, is the reward strong enough to take that risk? 
And, you know, same with deadlifts, like people, you know, deadlift craze, everybody. I love the dead. I hate the barbell deadlift. And I love the deadlift pattern because mm-hmm. every day you got to, you know, you got to pick stuff up and move it. Totally. You got to bend down. So like, I like kettlebell deadlifts. I love kettlebell deadlifts. Barbell deadlifts, barbell deadlifts are one of those patterns. I think you have to have done and you should develop some competency, you know, like double body weight deadlift for a younger person. I'm not going to make a 70 year old who's never lifted before do with barbell deadlifts. I'm not going to make a 50 year old who's never lifted before do barbell deadlifts. They don't have the proprioception usually because you don't, you know, what's the margin for error in certain lifts? Some lifts are great. Some lifts real bad. Yeah. So if it goes bad on a barbell deadlift and you hurt your back, you're, you're, you're hurt for a long time. And then it's always an issue. So I'm always looking at, can that person do those? What, what primal patterns are they missing? You know, most people, you know, gates, a big, big one gate, like you said, like, so older people, gate mechanics are really important. So it's like, whether, you know, I don't have a lot of people crawl because the older people, the risk get hurt their shoulders and the knees. Now, if you got a really motivated, someone who's a student, right, that really, really does their homework, does their stretching, does their body, mate, really wants it, sure. Then I'll, I'll, you know, encourage them to take it further, further. But most people can't walk. Yeah. I mean, seriously, most people cannot coordinate, you know, contralateral shoulder, hip, contra opposite hip rotation. So what do they need to load it for? What are they, you know, so... I'm going to the base level of all those primal patterns. Yeah. And try to see whether they can get in there. So mm-hmm. that's the that's the base thing. And the biggest risk for older people, and you know, 60 is really kind of the the telltale line for me. 50s, you're still, you know, I don't count that as really older, but 60 things start to really fall off a cliff faster. Mm. Um and falling. I I mean. People fall. I can't even believe now these last couple of years, how many clients they fall regularly. And luckily they haven't hurt themselves badly, but people fall because they're not paying attention when they're walking. They don't have, you know, they don't have the dorsiflexion. So they're shuffling, blah, blah, blah. But so balance, walking gait mechanics and ability, yeah. um, proprioception, like where are my feet? Do you know where your feet are when you're placing most people don't. And then reflexes, right? Can you recover, which relates to power? You know, it's funny because I was going to, I was in, going to write a book with um, Dr. Ken Ford years ago. And we were looking at Boomer Fitness. It's called Boomer Fitness or something like that. Yeah. And I, and I did a lot of research on the books that were out there. And you know what one of the big tests for old people is? How fast they can cross like a double sided street. Mm. You know the stop the, the the walk signs sure. 15 seconds it's it's a challenge for older people to go from their side of the street across the cross uh, across the street in that 15 seconds oh yeah and that's a power component right oh. and you stride do you have enough strike as opposed to you know you're shuffling and doing these little baby steps right yeah so that's you know rule number one is don't get hurt yeah yeah, you know, I those uh, are the things. Those primal patterns, especially gait, are like the first thing I'm really interested in hearing about somebody. And yeah, you can break that down as far as you want. No, oh, definitely. No, and you you mentioned the crossing the street thing. I remember years ago when I lived in Jerusalem, there was an mm-hmm. older lady. She wasn't like she was maybe in her fifties. She just wasn't in in great shape. Mm-hmm. I, I suppose sixties is a possibility. I don't recall specifically, but I remember. She had groceries in in her hand, in, mm-hmm. in one hand, and she was not at a crosswalk. The uh, crosswalk was a little ways away, but she was crossing before the crosswalk, and she fell in the middle of the street, mm-hmm. and there was oncoming traffic. And fortunately, I ran over, and fortunately, the, there was a there was a bus that was slowing down because the guy saw it happen. So mm-hmm. you know nobody was going to be able to pass him. It was just a, kind of a narrow street. But it's like if the bus driver hadn't been paying attention, or if she had. Uh, banked on being able to cross it sooner, it would have been a horrendous and then accident. Can, can that person push up off the floor, get up yeah. off the floor, stand up? That's not a small thing. No. I remember years and years ago, too, speaking of, you know, having, when I was living in Israel, there was a, a lady that I was training. Uh, her name was Sue, and she 
you know, retired and, and moved to Israel. And uh, a lot of what we did was basically getting up and down off the floor, getting out of a progressively lower seat, using progressively exactly. less, less um, uh, assistance from the hands. And she was saying, she was talking to some of her friends over Shabbat meal, who also took like an, it was like an, a senior fitness class. Cause Sue was right. like 75 when I started working with her. And uh, so they said, so what do you, you know, what do you do with your, uh, with your trainer? And she said, well, a lot of like moving around on the floor and getting up and down off the ground and stuff like that. And they're like, well, we don't get down on the ground at all. Right. And I was like, now I, I told her, I was like, well, now who do you think is going to be in better shape if they, if they do fall on the ground? I mean, oh, yeah. He knows what to do because we we worked on it so you much. You got to be comfortable on the floor. Yeah, I mean, one of another big things, and we're, this will be another component of what we're talking about in terms of, you know, flexibility, mobility, tissue quality. Can you sit on the floor without the back support? Yeah, with your legs out with your legs crossed. I mean, those things seem trivial when you're twenty or thirty, but they're not trivial when you're fifty, sixty, seventy. Yeah, and you know the thing, the 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 fear of falling has a lot to do with never being on the floor yeah. right so you have people that don't encounter the floor in any positive way not used to getting on and off can't sit properly so as soon as they start to fall they panic yeah and rightfully so because they don't know what's going to happen the people like i said i've had a lot of clients that have tripped and fallen but they're all used to everybody's on the floor every workout yeah. right and they get up off the floor every workout yeah. So, and they're strong in a pushing pattern. Like the most, to me, the most important pushing pattern is a push up Agreed. of any variation, kneeling, angled, whatever, just utilizing that, all those muscles in, in that pattern in conjunction the, with the coordination. So, that pushing pattern is crucial. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then comfortable sitting on the floor, rolling, turning on the floor, and all that stuff. Everything else is, it's, it's all based on, again, their, their history. Mm -hmm. their abilities their desires like you know you know you have, you have somebody that's really you know ready to go and wants to accomplish a lot it's a whole different thing as somebody who's like i'm doing this because i was told i have to and i know i have to but i really don't enjoy it and i'm you, you know <laughs> i'm not going to participate fully because i don't want to it's like okay i got it but don't expect the same results yeah. or don't expect great results well, speaking of Sue, who I mentioned earlier, she used to, uh, she used to joke. She never really liked exercise. She she said she always just hated it, but for her, the motivation was she was basically a candidate for a double knee replacement surgery, mm -hmm. and she knew that that could either be the best thing that ever happened to her, or she could end up crippled. And in her case, you know, because she was she was a tad overweight and she was mm -hmm. not in in great physical condition anyway. It was a risk she didn't want to take. So she hated it. Sure. And she did everything I told her because the, the vision of like a much worse Injured outcome. people listen better. It's one of my basic rules. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I think you've also had that advantage. It's like a silver lining sort of a thing of you've learned a lot from your injuries well enough to be oh, able to, yeah, to, to be able to guide other people. And so, you know, one of my curiosities then is that when it comes to fitness training, uh, what things do you have your older clients focusing on more? We we kind of broached this topic a little bit because you talked about power output and being able to cross a street and, and the, the seven functional movement patterns. But let's zoom in a little bit and let's look in particular at like, like on a training session with somebody who's new. Let's say maybe they haven't really done a whole lot of training. They were never an athlete. Um, what are some of the primary things uh, that you might have them do within a given session um, using what we talked about, talking like a brand new person. Yeah. Let's say like to totally brand new. Like how do you get them started? Basically, sort of I teach them the, the two things I always start with, you know, if I'm in person, I'm doing a physical assessment of their joint flexibility, right? Yeah. Joint mobility, right? You know, hip range of motion, how close it is to normal, what's asymmetrical, but that aside, um, the first thing I do is, is, you know, I'll teach them how to swing and, and to teach them how to swing. I have to teach them how to deadlift. Yeah. So it starts with a kettlebell deadlift and it progresses from there. Kettlebell deadlift, then, a, you know, a pendulum swing, just like we did, you know, the old progressions that we did RKC yeah. um, before Strong first got fancy, um, you know. So it was basically, a, you know, it was a deadlift. It was a pendulum swing. It was a hike pass. It was a single rep swing. And then I teach about a swing because the swing, you know, after all these years, I mean, I still haven't found anything that comes close to it because yeah. you can program it for anything. And power is the best thing, right? So 
with every kettlebell swing, you, it's the safest way to train for power. Yeah. The lightweight with medium weight, heavy weights, whatever. So you're going to be tra training fast twitch fibers. You're going to be training cardiovascular endurance. You're going to be training back stability. You're going to be training balance, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you know that kettlebell gets out in front of you, it's going to pull you right off balance. So it, you're going to train balance. You're going to train, you can train absolute strength, but you don't need to even a little bit of, you know, moderate strength with working up to a small kettlebell, still strong, heavy strength training for most older people. So that progression of teaching people how to swing and then walking in place. Yeah. Because walking in place, you start to cover gait mechanics, you cover balance because they're on one foot all the time, proprioception, like where is my knee relative to my shoulder, where are my hips, all those types of things. So those are the main things and that will cover most of the, the, the session. And then, you know, people say, well, I, I know how to swing. It's like, great, what can you do? Mm -hmm. Can you do, you know, 10 sets of 10 with what? Can you do 10 sets of 10 with a short rest period? You know, can you, what bell level can you use? Can you do one arm swing? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's where training starts to me. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, oh, I'm doing this exercise, then I'm going to go to that exercise. It's like, you start here, can you get to here? Yeah. Right? I mean, do you, where do you want, like, I have a guy that all we do when we train is snatch. That's what he wants to do. Is you that know, the BJJ guy? The snatch test, huh? Is that the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guy? You're talking about an older client. This is a different client. No, okay. Danny does... Denny does every all the things he's does everything, but this Denny's done the snatch test. But this guy, I told him at the beginning, it's like if you're only going to do one thing, train to pass the five minutes uh, strong for a snatch test, because if you can do that with a with a standard bell, and he's forty years old, so he's a younger guy, mm -hmm. that's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck: upper body, mm -hmm. lower back, body power output, you know, cardiovascular, everything you can do. And he's 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 done it with the twenty kilo. Now we're working on the twenty four kilo. Very nice. So he did it with the 60. You know, that's the other thing when people say, well, uh, you know, I want to pass the snatch test. It's like, I, I tried it with the 24 and I failed. It's like, well, did you do it with the 20? No, you do it with the 16. No, it's like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You know, it's like, why would you start there? Like, do it with something. The concept of progression in training is like completely lost. But again, you know, if, if all you did twice a week was snap, do a five minute snatch test or even a five minute swing test, that's going to cover 90% of the basis that you're going to get from 99% of all training. Yeah. Right. So, and it's in terms of, again, remember what I was talking about risk reward, it's the safest way you're going to approach it. So you, you're going to get the most for the least risk, which mm -hmm. is, you know, cause if you're injured, you can't train. If you can't train, you can't make progress. Yeah. And every day that you're off, you're going backwards. So it's, you know, you got to ramp back up to where you were before, before you start going forward. So the main rule is try not to get injured. Yeah, and I think that's this is a good uh, time to segue too. But I remembered what I was going to mention earlier, and this is a, a perfect example of it. You know, sometimes injuries happen that you, you can work around. It's like, you know, this is a very, very minor example. But uh, for the first time in almost 10 years, I, I tore the skin on my right hand swinging. I just mm -hmm. it was too much chalk. I think my, you know, it's too far into the... Uh, Bell wasn't too heavy. It was just, I was using chalk. I'm not used to it and just mm -hmm. tore. And so I'm like, okay, well, I, the, the exact program that I had in mind, I can't do. So I wonder if there are other things that I can in terms of like the ballistic component of my, mm -hmm. of my training. And so, you know, probably what I'll do this week while I just let it completely heal up is two hand swings, you know, instead of right. one armors. And so it's like, oh, yeah. I got to find a way forward. And one of the issues that I see a lot is that uh, because it's a double-edged sword and that, or we'll say two sides of the same, two sides of a, of a coin where, uh, let's say a professional will write a program, maybe a program that's designed for people in general to do. So it's not specific mm -hmm. to one person and they'll say, okay, if you're and the person will be asked, well, can I make changes to this and that? And, and the answer would be one of two things. Um, if you're changing this and that, and this and that, then you're not doing the program, which is like, right. it, on the one hand, it is true. And that program provided it can be done from start to finish as intended it's going to get you going 100 miles an hour in that direction mm -hmm. so it's maybe more optimal but we don't live in optimal conditions we have mm -hmm. to look at practicality too and so a lot of times when people reach out to me because they're like hey can i switch this with that or this or whatever provided it's not um a totally like a vanity thing and mm -hmm. that there's a good reason behind it i'll say sure and i'll point out okay you know you may not get the exact results you want because mm -hmm. It's designed, you know, to, for, to get you like a certain thing, but 
you'd, you'd be better off going 65 miles an hour instead of 100 oh, yeah. as opposed to going zero, which is the other alternative. Like either do it the way it's written or don't do it, which I don't think is very helpful for most people. Like if there's a need- Well, you also have to ask why they want to switch it. That's what I mean. Because if it's a van- yeah, is it too like, hard? Yeah, well, I, I remember there was a or program- it's boring. Yeah, yeah. there's a program <laughs> I wrote- I wrote some time back um, that remains. It's a, one of my more popular ones called "The Secrets of Strength," and it's mm -hmm. like a blend of you know kettlebells and calisthenics, but also uh, stretching and original strength resets. And it's designed to all kind of fit together in a way where you get like a full picture in your training, where it's not like you're only training covering all the bases. Yeah, and so somebody reached out and asked, "Hey, can I get rid of L sits and replace them with something else?" And I said, if you need to, sure. But he decided he was going to stick with the L-sits and he found that, you know what, actually kind of sticking it out for the first couple of sessions turned out to be the best approach because now I feel like I'm making real progress with them. The I think he, he had a hip issue that he was worried about or a hip flexor issue and he said mm -hmm. it didn't actually cause him any problems. So if somebody has an issue like that where they're like, can I switch out this ab exercise for this one? You know, there's so, I mean, there's so many different exercises. There's always a workaround. There's That's exactly always it. a workaround. I always say a swing is a swing is a swing. Yeah. A two hand, a one hand, a hand to hand. I, I don't do two hand swings because they tend to hurt my back. Yeah. But I don't, I don't have any, if I could, I would, you know, it's like, I don't see, cause the swings, a hit drive. So yeah. it's, a, it's a hit. It's a swing, it's a swing, it's a swing. Your choice is your choice. Yeah. Um, but it's like, I don't, every exercise has so many, you know, you're doing a press, you're doing a barbell press, you're doing a dumbbell press, a double dumbbell press, seated dumbbell press, seated barbell press. I mean, there's a million variations on a thing. What are they doing? They're working a press pattern. They're working the shoulders, the triceps, blah, blah. Are you doing it as a lift? Or are you doing it as an exercise? Are you doing it for shoulder muscular development? Are you doing, what are you doing it for? Why are you doing it? You know, what's the end range? What's the starting point? Where are you trying to go? And that, I think, is one of the biggest things I see that is a pet peeve of mine is everybody kind of drops in in the middle of everything. It's like, where did you end up? I never see people's, I see very few where people say, I started here and now I'm here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started my press training 10 years ago, at, you know, basically 55 pounds for five reps with the bar. Mm hmm and now, you know, I'm doing two, 220 to 225 every week. And it took me 10 years because so much of the problem was it's, it's a complicated move. It's like a deadlift or a squat. It's not, it's not a shoulder exercise. If I was just doing a shoulder exercise, I'm not trying to max it out. So, again, mm -hmm. depends on what you're trying to get out of that lift. Do I need muscle mass? And that, speaking of boomers, this is a good point to say. And it's like, People do not realize the importance of building and maintaining muscle mass as they get older. Yeah. It's crucial. It's crucial, crucial, crucial. Because one, if you need it, it takes a long time to build and it's super easy to lose it. So if you get sick, you get cancer, you get pneumonia, you get anything where you're down, the first thing your body's going to peel off is muscle mass. Yeah. And if you have almost none and then you lose half of that, what do you think holds you up? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the problems, these people like the, the woman you said, they can't get out of their chair. They can't get off the floor. They don't have enough strength because they don't have any muscle mass. Now, yeah, skinny strong is one thing and you can nervous system activation. Absolutely 100% true. But basic muscle building stuff goes such a long way to circumvent your lack of nervous system coordination. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, people make fun of, you know, like this was older. I don't even know if they have fitness bodybuilders anymore, but, you know, they don't train with heavy weights and all that. It's like, it doesn't matter. The lightest weight that a, any a, a fitness bodybuilder would train with is still big enough for the average person to get super decently strong, mm -hmm. right? They're only using 10 pound dumbbells. Well, if you're a 75 year old person doing 10 pound dumbbell work and putting on some, you know, shoulder mass, or upper back mass whatever is going to go a long way. Yeah. So those things are for older people, make muscle mass and then, you know, metabolism. Like I have a client, we just went through this whole thing about her body weight or, you know, she got metabolically analyzed. And it's like, she doesn't have enough muscle mass. And I mean, I, well, the doctor said, well, your muscle mass is fine, but your metabolic rate is slow. I said, well, does the doctor not understand 
that there's a direct correlation between muscle mass and metabolic rate. You know, muscle burns calories at rest. Fat does, is metabolically inactive. Yeah. So if you want to increase your metabolic rate, you need to increase your muscle mass. You know, so, you know, there's a great book by two docs back. Um, what What is the name of uh, biomarkers mm -hmm. by two Harvard doctors? And that must have been 15 years ago. And the top of their 10 biomarkers for prolonging, for aging slowly. And for all the listeners out there, if you want a, the best book that I've read so far on the importance of um, the, the important qualities for boomers is this biomarkers. And I was surprised because muscle mass was higher than strength, which was a complete shock to me because muscle mass includes strength, but in terms of cardiovascular ability, body fat levels, car, you know, insulin levels, ability to keep your body, you know, control your body temperature, all those things are directly uh, related to, to muscle mass. And if you don't have that, those things all suffer. Strength, you can be strength through your neurological strength or tendon strength, whatever. But muscle mass is important in that way. So again, are you eating to support your muscle mass growth and maintenance? That's not easy because, you know, the first thing that falls off when you get sick is your muscle mass. Yeah, I had to write that down, biomarkers. I'm going to make sure I, I pick that book up because that's one of the things, you know, I'm not really at an age where it's a concern, um, but it is one of the things that I want I like to do things well in advance if I possibly can. And more importantly, people who rely on me for their, you know, strength right. and fitness information. It's very important to know that. And I, it's the best book I've read late of late and it still, it holds up. I just looked at it a couple months ago just to check on some things. And it's like, mm -hmm. there's nothing in there that I still wouldn't say is that, you know, the, the, the cutting edge in terms yeah. of training, in terms of imp approach to that, right. It was yeah. a higher than cardiovascular fitness. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because fitness. there there are certain biomarkers. I'm sure they covered this in there, like grip strength and mm -hmm. I think leg strength. Those are two of them where a lot of times doctors or nurses or healthcare professionals can test those two things, and then allegedly, in many cases, they can accurately sure. determine. Well, strength was number two. Muscle mass was one. Strength was two. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but because it's such a there's such a strong correlation. Again, not causation, but correlation between. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, certain types of strength in particular and uh, certain types of disease. Uh, I remember reading somewhere, I'll have to send you the article afterward, um, that sometimes they can even accurately uh, guess Predict. yeah, what uh, what stage of cancer you have if somebody has right. uh, has cancer. So people, it's again, it's not to say that you strengthen your grip and you'll never get cancer or anything like that, but it gives well, you a fighting chance. Well, if you look chance. at it, you know, Pavel's always said this, and I completely agree. It's like the three biggest neural generators of strength, your hands, your abs, and your glutes. Yeah. So, and this is 100% true. I've never met, and I don't think anybody ever will meet, a person with really strong hands and a weak body. Yeah. Or a person with really strong glutes or really strong core and a weak body. Right. You, you know, shake hands with any mechanic or any farmer. Right. They don't do any specific exercise, but their hand strength, because, you know, grip work, everything comes along for the ride. You yeah. can't you can't. And if your grip goes, everything goes. You can't Silver. hold on to things. It's like pretty much if you <laughs> were going back to deadlifts and carries and stuff like that, it's like you can pretty much. Drill down life to the act of picking stuff up, carrying it, putting it down, picking it up, carrying it somewhere else and putting it down. Yeah. And if you just did that, you know, pick something up, carry it, put it up, pick it up, carry it over, put it down, pick it up. I mean, that'll train everything. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, that's pretty much, you know, moving life, construction, housework, kids, dogs, whatever. You're always picking something up. And if yeah. you can't, it becomes very obvious how, how depleted you are because yeah. you can't bend down. Right. Exactly. And you can't stand up or you can't hold on to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think about uh, the number of things that you mentioned there. And then when you're, hand, I mean, let's say you hurt your hand or, you know, both your hands or something like that. So the amount of activity that you now can't do that you would normally do oh. is, is. Well, huge. here's a good point for boomers. One of the big things I find, and I've had this, it's called trigger finger, right? Mm. Have you heard of this? Of course. Right. So I woke up one morning and my thumb was locked and it wouldn't unlock. And it feel like if I tried to straighten, it was going to break. And then when I finally got it to come up, I couldn't get it to bend again because I had trigger finger. 
and it would felt literally like the joint was going to break if I tried if I tried to force it. Wow. So, I mean, I, I worked my way through that because, you know, for some reason, and I, I joke about this all the time, but I, I'm ready. Eventually, they're going to give me the, the Nobel Prize for the discovery that muscles attach to bones. Because yeah. as far as I'm concerned, I've yet to meet the doc or the PT that acknowledges muscles attached to bones. Because yeah. if there's a joint injury, it's always something else, but never the muscle directly attached to the bone that has the effect. So what did I do? You know, I did my body main thing. I released the flexor pollicis, released the flexor pollicis longus, the brevis, activated the extensor, decompressed the joint, bingo, it yeah. worked. I've got three clients that, you know, that had trigger, trigger fingers or trigger thumbs, apropos of nothing other than living life inflection. When one got to surgery, then he had the cortisone shot. Guess what? It didn't work because yeah. it didn't address the muscles that attach to the bones <laughs> because- the doctor, they don't cover that in med school anymore, ever. Muscles yeah. don't attach the bones. There's this somehow magic thing that happens in between. But anyhow, yeah. trigger fingers, hands, like the hands you talked about grip, like all day long, we're like this. How much time do we spend with extension or stretching, right? And hands are analogous to feet, right? Ankles, toes, you know, and people, how many people's toes are like hammers, right? Hammer toe, right? Yeah or bunions or stuff like that. Cause they have no mobility in their big toe. Yeah. Injure that thing. Oh, that's a, that's, that could be a forever process, right? They have no toe flexion yeah. or like, you know, your, your, your leg stuff and your pistols and your, all that stuff is amazing. Just imagine if your ankle didn't bend. Oh, it wouldn't even be possible. Exactly. And that's 99% of old people. Their yeah. ankles, they think it's their knee that hurts and their knee hurts because their ankle doesn't bend. Their ankle doesn't bend because they have no mobility in their foot or they got plantar fascia because their ankle, their toes are locked down. I mean, it yeah. just, it's all connected on that way. And it all comes down to one of the other questions you're asking was recovery, right? Yeah. So as you get older, regardless of your approach to it or your nutrition or your genetic ability or whatever, your recovery is going to take a dump. Yeah, it just is. At a certain point, you just can't recover. Yeah. So you, that really limits the loading. The loading is directly related to the progress, right? So you can't you can't load. One of my good friends who was an older guy, rode hard, put up wet type of you know combat vet guy. He said, you know, at my age, going backwards slowly is going forward. Mm -hmm. I love that because it is. I mean. You know, you're not going to be, you know, it's if you start training whatever lift at 60, 65 years old, you're not going to set world records. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, I'm not talking about age group world records. No, I'm talking, talking about over, real, overall. right? So, like, I have X amount of strength. I want to maintain it. That's mm -hmm. progress. You may not be putting more weight on the bar, but you're not taking weight off the bar. Yeah. And that's a direct result of recovery. So what's recovery entail, right? Passive and active. You know, some people can't stop moving. They can't sit. They can't relax. They can't, they can't med forget meditation. They can't sit in one spot for five minutes unless the TV's on. Yeah. Right. So re active recovery, massage, flexibility, mobility, you know, hydration, body maintenance, tissue work, tissue, again, coming back to tissue quality. If you've got really crappy beef jerky tissue, expect things to break or tear or, you know, spring you know they're gonna pop yeah so and then you can't train so it's like all those things and your your, uh, your nutrition and finding out what works for you that allows you to recover so the other thing is how do you know you're recovered you're recovery because you're making progress if you never measure which most people don't want to do because if you measure it tell you know it's the same thing as how many people and i've had these clients forever and ever it's like well what do you weigh so i don't know we mean you know so i don't weigh myself it's like why don't you weigh yourself i don't want to see what it has to say yeah well you still weigh the same whether you whether you scan on the scale or not but they don't want to know well, how do you know if your diet's working or not right. working so it's like there's an assumption that people are adults which is a really big assumption or the assumption that being an adult somehow means responsible people will yeah. try to avoid <laughs> responsibility both ways like yeah. you know you're you're an old person chronologically, but you're really not a, an adult because you can't be rational. Yeah. But 
that's the point. It's like looking at those metrics and, and seeing like, okay, do I, is my body weight? Like I want to do pull-ups. Well, you're 50 pounds overweight. How do I do pull-ups? Lose 50 pounds. Your pull-ups will come up, right? All those little details. That's the thing as you get older. Are you doing this because you really want to make progress? Are you trying to maintain something where you're starting from scratch? Everybody's an individual and you have to be able to approach it that way. And then, you know, the whole consistency thing over time, it's like, are you willing? Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to talk about. And one of these days I'm going to write this, uh, you know, the importance of routine. Yeah. You know, it's like people, I, I love to hear it's like, well, I didn't, I didn't have time to work out today. It's like, well, what time is your training schedule? It's like, I, I train, like, I don't have a training schedule. It's like, how's that working out for you? Yeah. Like I know. Okay. It's, eight o'clock on Saturday morning, I'm in the gym. That's my training schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay. If something comes up, it's like, well, can you do it at eight on Sunday? No, I can't. That's training. Yeah. Right. People are loath to have the routine, but yeah. I can't, I couldn't. The reason I have this longevity hundred percent is because of my routine. Yeah. You know, I have a stretching routine. I have a time, not a routine. It's not the, the actual component of the exercise is irrelevant. It's the fact that I'm scheduled. Yeah. Exactly. You know, this day I do this, this day I do that, this time I do that. It's, it's scheduled. It's sacrosanct. That's it. People have a tendency to, I think, uh, overestimate number one, their intent and number two, the value of intensity and, um, the completely underestimate. I, I think I have a theory as to why the value of routine and not even discipline. I mean, I think discipline is important, but it's easier to build discipline if you've already got something built into your schedule where you just, right. it's, it's, you have to do it. And I, I think part of it is, um, you know, people see training it, uh, let's be honest, you know, most Americans are not in great shape. I would say a lot of people in the Western <laughs> world, it's an That's understatement. Generous. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like, calling, it's like calling the ocean moist, you know, it's a little exactly. bit of an understatement. Yeah. Um, but the same could be said uh, to some degree or another, even, of, you know, outside of America, we could look at, you know, uh, Europe and stuff like that. I don't think the problems are anywhere nearly as great in Europe, but to some degree, uh, strength training or fitness is a hobby. I don't think it should be that way. I think it should be like brushing your teeth. It's just a non-negotiable, mm -hmm. but people want a level of entertainment out of it. Similar from other hobbies, like let's say pickleball, you know, right. um, and when, when they have to get down to business, like when, when some of the fun st stuff goes away and it becomes more like, okay, you know, I have to treat this seriously. The excitement can't, the, the, there may not be an excitement there, but in order to get what I want out of this, I just need to be consistent. It's called working. Yes. Out. Working work. out people bristle. Work. That exactly. key component of that word work. Yeah. It's I've, I've don't call it playtime. Exactly. Playing out. It's not called playing, playing out, out. Right. working out. Yeah, once you're past six or seven, you don't get playtime anymore. It's not exactly. a play date. It's they a send you to the coal mine. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's another important component. Like you said, it's a hobby. It's like that only became important when our physical, our our life did not cease to revolve around survival at that level. Like yeah, yeah. farmers, you don't have to work out, right? Their life is a workout, right? Yeah. They mean they need more rest than they need work, right? Oh, yeah. So it's like if you're, you know, if you're a construction person, it, it varies what used to be construction, what is now. But I'm just saying, if you have a physical job or your life revolves is a very physical uh, activity, it's a completely different world. If you're, you know, you're sitting behind a desk 12 hours a day. Yeah. And if you look at how most people's lives, I mean, they spend 90 percent of the time seated. I, that's another thing I ask clients to do. They refuse to do. It's like put a clock on your your sit time. Just t every time you're sitting, turn the timer on. And when you stand up, turn it off and see how many hours a day. And then you add in car time. Then you add in sleep time. Then you add in sitting, watching television at nighttime. There's, you know, say they sleep eight hours a day, right? So that's 24 minus eight. So that's what is that? 16, right? And then the rest of the 16, they're probably seated 13. And that's, that's being generous. Oh yeah. Most people, all they do is sit. Yeah. I'm getting uncomfortable just sitting here. I was um, thinking the same thing. Yeah, because it's like, but that's that's modern life. It, that yeah. wasn't that way very short time again. So it's like now training exercise is a hobby to make up for, you know, I've always thought of, you know, the time things we do with the kettlebell is condensed manual labor. Yeah. You know, it's it's compressed in that you get this huge amount of work in a short amount of time because 
the rest of our life is just not physical. And if it is, people complain. Oh, yeah. You know, it's funny. I was just watching <laughs> completely weird segue. I was watching a, um, If I Were a Rich Man from Fiddler on the Roof yesterday, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I wouldn't have to work hard, right? I mean, that was the whole thing back then. It's like life was so hard because it was so physical. You know, you yeah. wanted to get warm. You got to go cut the wood. You got to go drag, cut the tree down, cut the wood up, bring the wood to the thing, stoke the fire, do this, clean out the ashes, cut new wood, blow. And that's just one little component of just trying to keep warm. Yeah. Right. Every aspect of your life was a physical demand. And now yeah. it's like, man, <laughs> my Amazon delivery is late. <laughs> Instacart. What happened to my Instacart? Right. Yeah. It's getting the point. We're going to be these little disembodied heads on these little jelly blobs that yeah. run around in a, one of those carts they have. The Yeah. I know what you're talking about. There was like, what was that movie? Um, yeah, I was just yeah, the, I know the one. The androgynous, all... blobby people just yeah, sitting, yeah. and that's yeah. that's happening as we speak. Yeah. So, but I mean, I think for people, you know, from that point of view where it is a hobby, you want to be as efficient as possible. And I differentiate between training and exercise, and I have nothing against either. Right? Training is really you're focused on a goal and a destination, yeah. and miss sometimes a deadline. Like I know for me. Like one of my big goals, I want to be able to press 225 till I want to be the only 70 year old in the world that's ever pressed 225. So it's like I've done it from 64 up to now. I got to do it in when I turn 67. But that's my goal. So that's training. Like the other stuff is, you know, exercise is great. If all you do is exercise and you do it regularly, you're going to be 90, 90 million miles ahead of everybody else who can't make themselves. You know, it's too much work to go to the get off the couch and get another jelly donut. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and tis the season for that, you know. But uh, but they will do it all year round. That's the problem. Um, oh yeah. No, that's 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 yeah. It's year round. It's insane. But I mean, you know, and people, you know, the old the little joke we had is like you can't out snatch, you can't outrun a donut. It's like yeah, you can. It just takes all day. Yeah. You exactly. snatch for eight hours. You can outrun the donut. <laughs> yeah, I know. I remember, I think it was my friend Jordan Syatt posted something about this to get people to understand the value of a proper diet in terms of uh, fat loss for those who are mm -hmm. interested. And he said, your basal metabolic rate is responsible for the majority of the calories you burn. So it's mm -hmm. something like 70%. And he said, you know, this like little band you see right here is exercise uh, in terms of how much you burn in, in terms of your, your total calories. So it's like you, you kind of have to take your 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 diet seriously. It's not just like, oh, I'll train a little bit harder and that'll just burn everything up. I just had that conversation with a client just the other day. We we're talking about her meta, basic metabolic rate. And I said, well, first thing you got to recognize, like you get on the, the she, she wasn't on the treadmill. It's like, say you burn 200 calories on the treadmill. You still have to substitute, you have still have to subtract the 50 calories that you would burn at rest from that, right? Yeah. So you're burning, say you're burning, she was burning 1,200 calories a day, the metabolic. And this was like a, you know, big body scan type thing. So 1,200 calories a day, it's about 50 calories an hour. So whatever exercise you do, if you add it up, you still have to su subtract those basic metabolic rate from that. So that 150 calorie walk you took is now a 100 calorie walk, which you just negated by the cookie you ate as soon as you walked in the door. Yeah. So, I mean, at a certain point, you can go by feel if you're, you know, at your certain level and you, you know, you've done it long enough, but if you're not, you have to be rigorous. Same with training, right? Yeah. If you're not, beginners all need to start at it. They need to be regimented as yeah. they get more advanced. And that could be a beginner at anything, right? You have to be regimented. So it's like, if you don't, it's going to fall off really fast. Once mm -hmm. you get to a point where you can go with, you know, what's, um, what is Kenneth Chase thing about, you know, beginners need to follow, follow the rules, intermediates, Beginners learn the rules, intermediates have Beginners to learn the rules, intermediates follow the rules, advanced make their own rules. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing as, you know, reverse engineering with the best do. The best don't, the best really, it's what is it called? Auto regulation, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to be able, at my point, I, I mean, I can't follow, I don't follow a specific program at all. It's like what feels right that yeah. day. I have, you know, and that's again, you've got proprioception of, you know, where your joints are in space, but you yeah. also have, you know, this kinesthetic sense and the auto regulation of like, what's my body telling me? Yeah. 
you know, you're always getting the signals. You're always getting the feedback. Are you listening? And then did you hear it? Okay, what does that mean? What should I do? Does it mean I push harder? Does it mean I back off? People are, you know, then you get the other person, you got the lazy guy, and then you got the hard charger that, you know, the program says this, I'm doing it, you know, I'll, I'll go to the ER right after, but it's like ER or I'm ER. finishing this program. Yeah. Yeah. And good. Then you, you miss workouts for the next two months because you're stupid. Exactly. And then right? it's like you, you end up further behind than when you began. Oh, that's what I'm saying. The rule number one is do not avoid injuries at all costs because they're exactly. just, they put you back so further than skipping it or modifying it or just backing it off. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is one of the things too, where it really helps, you know, I know auto regulation was kind of the rage a number of years ago. Um, and then I think it's kind of becoming a buzzword thing again, and it's valuable, but the problem is that you really do need to be beyond an intermediate level. You really kind of have to be. Well, you, no, that's, that is literally experts. That's advanced yeah. level stuff. And you have, you can't fake that. You have to earn no. that, right? You know, let me give you a good example too. And I'm sure you'll be familiar with the name, maybe a name that you've not heard in a long, long time, a la Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mm -hmm. um, but Chet Yorton, he had a very, oh, of course, no, of course. Yeah. He had a very particular approach that he did because he figured out that it was exactly right for him in the off season. He would do two sets of 22 with a bench mm -hmm. press, uh, deadlift squat and military press, I think. And then when he was in bodybuilding season, well, then he would do something different to, you know, bring up lagging right. body parts or whatever, but two sets of 22, which is like a very precise not two by 20 we're that's like that's just okay, ocd dude that's just ocd <laughs> yeah. but the, but the dude beat schwarzenegger on the stage he's the only american right. i mean that it. but those what that's what people these days don't recognize especially bros right yeah um they they don't recognize that you learn to go by that feel because the feel is correlated with actual results for totally. you yeah you know and at that level you but here's the thing. If you never train to get towards that level, you'll never achieve it. If yeah. if that's not a goal of learning how to auto-regulate, if that's not a goal of learning how to listen to your body's feedback, and that's for everybody, whether it's stretching or mobility or, you know, I mean, how many sessions a week is optimal? Like, okay, so I, I, I'm in the gym with weights three days a week, and then I ruck three days, twice a week. Mm -hmm. And then I have two days completely just Vegemite. Yeah. But that always that I mean, I always do my body maintenance first thing in the morning, and that's somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes of yeah. you know, foam rolling, stretching, you know, checking things out like what body did I wake up with this morning? Yeah, because you know, my whole thing is like, oh, you know, you're old when you wake up, you got injured sleeping, and that's true, dude. I'll wake yeah. up and like, how the hell did I hurt that? That didn't yeah. hurt last night, but yeah. you wake up and it's hurt, so you deal with it, yeah, but that's so total rest i have active rest i have complete rest i have you know light days i have heavy days so but you i mean like again i don't feel the need to do endless variety or keep switching exercises because the certain things pass the test of being hard enough and being safe enough yeah you know it's like why don't i you know i don't I mean, there's always the siren call of, oh, that looks like a really cool exercise. And it does. And 20 years ago, I would have played with it. But now I know, like, oh, you tried that before and it, you tweak this, you tweak yeah. that. It's like, I'm not, it's not, it's not, the game's not worth the candle. It's not yeah. fun, you know. So I stay with what I know works. And the rest of it is, you know, how's your sleep? How's your, how's your mental state? Are, are you doing anything about that? Are you constantly worried about stuff you can't do? Are you constantly stressed? Do you go to bed at the same time? Do you wake yeah. up at the same time? You know, it's like those types of, you know, like I put up that post, like, you know, you want to, everybody wants to be an athlete. Do you want to train like an athlete? You want to live like an athlete? You know, like athletes are, you know, you, you hang out with Olympic athletes and you learn how quick, how boring their life is. Yeah. I can't go to the party. I got to, I got this. And they, not only do they know they're training tomorrow, they know the workout. Yeah. Last week I did, you know, five side five sets of this with this weight. Next week, I get to do five sets of that with that weight. So they know, and I, I know what's coming tomorrow and I know how hard yesterday's workout was. So I got to prepare physically. And then the event, you know, are you, are you visualizing? Are you studying? Right. How many people study their lifts? How many people, like there's one guy I know, and I, I don't talk to him because he doesn't want to listen, but he's really strong dude. 
always getting hurt, tearing this bone off, tearing that bone off. And I'm looking at his list. I was like, dude, you're just, you're going to tear this hamstring in X amount of time. It's like, and I want to go up to him. It's like, dude, do you even know what your weak point is? He doesn't. Yeah. He, I can guarantee he doesn't know where the weak part of his lifts are because he does the same thing all the time. And he thinks aggression is going to overcome it. It's what's going to do is tear more bones off, up tear more, tear more muscles off. Bone. So yeah. at a certain point, are you a student of your own, you know, you like I have people, you know, people show me their list. They send me their list. It's like, okay, you critique it. You're a certified instructor. Yeah. You critique your own lift as if it was a student coming to you. Tell me what, what's wrong. Where's the technique flaw? Yeah. They don't want to do it. You know, I mean, you, I put up my videos for me yeah. to study for me. If anybody else looks at them, that's just, they're boring to anybody. But that's for me. I'm like always analyzing what I'm doing wrong or what I'm doing right. Mm -hmm. So I can see it's like, God, if I had only had this. And that's the other thing is like the technology is just so magnificent. Yeah, had I had an iPhone in 1970s when I was a gymnast, it would have changed the world. Yeah. We didn't even have film, man. I couldn't even see. I look back. I see films now on Facebook, Facebook group for an old gymnastics group, right? From the 60s and 70s gymnasts. It's like, how come I could now? No one. I never saw that film. It was literally flying blind. Now the tech is unbelievable. Yeah. You can deconstruct it down to the tenth of a second on the frame. Who takes advantage of that? Very never, few people. Yeah, it's never been easier to be extraordinary. Um, no, it's true. The people it's want really true. It's never been easier to be extraordinary. But here's the thing. That's why they call it elite. Yeah. If everybody was elite, it would mean nothing. Yeah. So I'm okay with most people being lazy and weak because it just makes it easier for me to be better. <laughs> well, you know, I also think the other thing too is that some people are some people are honest with themselves and they have their priorities in order. Like I give you an example for me, I've been taking boxing lessons over the last year, and uh, you know, I treat it as like it's a hobby. Like I I'm mm -hmm. not planning on competing. I'm doing it because I think it's a, a valuable skill to Great have. Skill. And uh, I'm learning a lot from it, and I'm also seeing some of the things. I'm like, wow, you know, I thought. I had kind of turned a corner and become a good athlete. And then I'm like, my coordination here, it's like, this seems like it's pretty simple, you know, coordinate the movement of the feet with this and that. And then it's like, Ain't nothing wow. simple about that. Yeah. It's called the sweet science for a reason, you right. know, but I also, I, uh, I have the right expectation because I not becoming planning on becoming the best right. in the world. It's like, so, um, I don't, I like, it's eye opening, for instance, when I, like I, we did a, I did a sparring session. I put it on my YouTube channel, uh, with my coach and we did, it was like uh, 10 two-minute rounds with like 30 seconds between rounds. That ain't easy. No, my cardio was actually okay. I mean, I managed the whole time. Mm -hmm. I remember last year doing that. I was like, I thought I was going to die. And I had a guy cornering me. He called one of the other guys in the gym over to corner me. The guy's like, so you need to do this and this. I'm like, dude. I'm dying over here. Like, I, yeah, <laughs> like, that's great advice, but I gotta. I, this is a much bigger hurdle I gotta cross. So the that tunnel is getting smaller. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that hurdle has been crossed. But when I looked at the video, I was like, you know, my hand speed was a bit slower. I mean, it was a light sparring session. So on the one hand, it's not perfect criticism, but it's still noteworthy. It's like mm -hmm. my hand speed could use some work, and so I told him that. I said, See, "That's the thing. You know that. Yeah. Because you studied it. Yeah." And if you increase, if you improve that, that's going to improve. I mean, then you'll find something else to improve. But yeah. those are the difference between the people that make progress and the people that don't. They yeah. take note. The devil's in the details, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is like, it, yeah, do you need to become a pro level boxer? Absolutely not. All you need to do is be better than you were. Exactly. And that's the approach. And then going back to one of the questions you asked me about, um, boomers and you know standards it's like sure. i don't have any there's no like you need to be able to do 10 of this or eight of that at this weight it's like you just have to be better than you were yeah i don't care about speed i care about trajectory and trend line mm -hmm. so as long as your 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 bite boxing is better than it was then you're in the right trend line totally. could it be faster sure but you there's a price to be paid for everything yeah you pull from here i mean you you got to rob Peter to pay Paul. So yeah. the extra work you do to get better at boxing could take away from another of your goals. Totally. Right. Yeah. So you have to, 
you have to um, make choices. You have to, ha you know, what is it? Someone, the root word of decide is to cut. Yeah, exactly. Right? So you have to cut. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do that. That means, but if you do that, then you have by default, you have to take responsibility for your choice. Mm -hmm. I chose this. I chose not to work this. I did choose to work this. And not choosing to work this means I'm going to go down in there. You can't complain. I mean, I just, that's like a big thing. I'm just so tired of hearing people complain about everything. Stop bitching. Yeah. Grow up. I'm serious. Take responsibility for your choices. I'm victimhood is just driving me nuts. Everybody's a freaking victim. Yeah. I think uh, it's especially it's, it's become endemic where people don't realize they're doing it. It's just like, you know, people, people are mimetic. I've heard it said. So it's like, they just want to, that people really want to fit in. It's, it's a rare person who doesn't want to fit in. Mm -hmm. And those people have a tendency to be annoying in their own way because their, their focus isn't necessarily on being better. It's just being different. But if you're going to try to be different in any way, try to stop mm -hmm. complaining and yeah, please start training. Yeah. The, the, the complaining, it's like, you know, like I don't want to hear like when it's 40 degrees out and my garage is 35 degrees. I don't want to hear my training partner say it's cold. It's like, yeah, dude, I know it's cold. Yeah. Okay. It's not necessary to say it. Complaining makes you weak. Yeah, it does. Or it's hot. You know, my favorite, one of my favorite things is Jocko's good, right? You've seen that, yeah, right? Of course. Good. It's cold. Okay, good. We'll get in better shape, right? Or this. It's good. That's the thing. It's like, it, it just doesn't, that's so part of getting tougher. Yeah. Internally, getting strong, Right. You know, I wrote that article, still one of my favorite articles I wrote for Strong First. Like, if you want to be strong, you got to be tough. Yeah. And toughness is a is a is not a popular concept for some reason. You know, well, I know the reason, but, you know, masculinity is on the decline in the standards. Like, the, the softening and the weakening and the feminization of men in the culture. It's like, no, you yeah. want to be tough. How do you get tough? Well, first, shut up. Yeah. Stop complaining. It's supposed to be hard. Yeah embrace it like i go out there you know i did my ruck this morning and i left this morning it's 39 degrees i'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt because i know in an hour i'm going to be warm so the first whatever i meet this guy he has his dogs and i always say hi to his dogs because i'm a dog freak now um and he's like he's bundled up he says aren't you cold it's like okay it's cold i'm not gonna die yeah right? and if i it just encourages me to walk faster yeah like but the main thing is is like stop complaining if you don't like it change it if you can't change it get help and if you can't change it or get help still stop complaining yeah it does it just makes everybody weaker huh totally i don't i don't know really he lost the dog he's got to be somewhere is he outside um yeah i mean i think that's part and parcel of the mindset because it's everything comes down to mindset yeah right because the mind Okay. The mindset is really the determinant. And this is for me at my point at my level, and I've been training literally continuously for 52 years now. Mm -hmm. I mean, nonstop since I was 14. My mind, as strong as it is, is still my weakest problem. Totally. And I get in there and it's like, okay, I know I got to press this bar and I've missed this every week for the last two weeks. And I've only missed it because I, I screw up the, I screw something up technically which is a mental construct right mm -hmm. <laughs> and i know i know other people are doing because i'm doing it's like i'm already getting ready i already got the excuses ready before i miss it to explain why i missed it because i i know it's gonna be a facebook it's gonna be a youtube i'm gonna have to explain why i miss this it's like shut up yeah to myself right just shut up stop complaining in advance <laughs> yeah stop setting up the excuse in advance you know stop being afraid to do it right definitely or Pablo says, fail like a professional. Exactly. Fail correctly. So it's like, I'm always, you know, that's why I need time to prepare. Like I prepare before the workout. I mm -hmm. prepare the night before. I like go over in advance because I know what I'm going to do. I know I'm yeah. an attempt. Yeah. Can I visualize it? And, th and the other thing that's another completely under underutilized program is visualization training. 
Agreed. You know, it's like, can you, I mean, I learned that, you know, Ed Cohn, all these, the greats of powerlifting, you know, he would talk about, you know, he would visualize the lift in, you know, stunning detail. He could smell the, the smell of the bar. He could smell the chalk. He could smell, you know, every little detail. And he'd visualize it from inside his body as if he's on the stage. He'd visualize it from sitting in the audience, looking at himself lift. And he'd visualize it at all those different levels. And I think that's, that's another level that people don't. And it takes, it costs nothing. There's no risk. There's nothing but upset. There's no downside to it. And then, you know, I learned that really the hard way um, when I was a gymnast. There was a trick I used to do or try to do in, in college. And my feet would always come across uh, apart when I tried to do the trick. And it's like I started. I, then I realized that I couldn't keep my feet together mentally doing the trick in my head. How, how messed up is that? I couldn't visualize the turn without my legs. Like, ah. Oh. And I practiced slowing it down literally to the frame part where like, okay, there are my legs. Like, and forcing is so much harder than you think to actually mentally do something in your head that should be like, oh, how can I not do it perfect? Because it's in my head. Mm -hmm. And when I could actually keep my feet together, I could keep them fit, feet together in real life. And that was like a major change in my mind. Yeah, big time. So I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, one of the hard things for people about visualization is um it it seems hard to measure you know like it's like did i lift more weight did i do more reps that's you can look at a piece of paper and see okay this is what i did wednesday here's what i did you know this week but with visualization i think because it's more nebulous people and people don't see, i disagree see i disagree it's nebulous because i think what's what's might be construed as nebulous is you're not looking at the right thing is like is it a, so say say as let's use a snatch snatch test okay where did you gas where did your technique fall down mm -hmm. okay so you know your two minute can you do can you do a five minute snatch test in your head at the right pace at a 20 rep per minute pace okay I'm not asking you but could one right yes. okay and so you know because you've done it and you know at three minutes in you're gasping for breaths and breath and your arms coming away it's not nebulous. You know, at that point, yeah. can I control that in my head? Now, that's a yeah. five minute test. That's a lot. But where you're doing a pick a lift, it doesn't matter. You're where like, I have body weight apart? military press. Yeah. Right. Where does your form fall apart? Where do your elbows flare out? Yeah. Where does your chest drop? But if you don't know what you're trying to do, it becomes very nebulous because you're not knowing what you're looking at. Exactly. And that's that's really the point, because the reality is, is people's minds are racing constantly and people are imagining things constantly. Mm -hmm. Like adults daydream all the time. I think, uh, you know, Matt Fury is a really great expert on the topic of visualization. And one mm -hmm. of the things that he's talked about, and you want to talk about a guy who's, you know, uh, achieved things at very high levels uh, mm -hmm. of athletics. He's NCAA, I think he was an NCAA champion. He was uh, in his weight class in wrestling. He was like top in the well, U.S. Say no more. In it, yeah. Say no more. If you're yeah. an NCAA wrestler, you're a god. <laughs> he trained with Dan Gable. Dan Gable yeah. was his coach. Yeah. Uh, you know, he uh, was a world champion in uh, a certain type of kung fu. He went to China and and won in the hundred. That's the one I, part I remember from him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, but he's one of the things he has said too, is sometimes people think, oh, I can't visualize. So he said, okay, so imagine, pretend, make believe, use whatever verb it, you, it is required. 100% correct. Yeah. But that's what you need to do. And people do that all the time. Like I catch myself sometimes. I'm like, I'm having a hard time focusing on what I want to achieve today. But you know, I can always think of some slight that somebody made to me and like, here's what I would have said if I could go back. Like everybody can do that. So, and people run through these, these movie scenarios in their mind all the time. What they don't realize is that it's basically just a steering wheel. So it's like mm -hmm. you're, the car is automatically going, but you need to learn how to steer right. it in the direction that you want it to. That was a big, that was another game changer for me in my gymnastics when I realized, um, because I was very much intellectualized my gymnastics, like, okay, hip turn, arm turn, look at here, look here, indexing it, right? A, yeah. B, C, D, these are the points. And then I realized it's too slow. Yeah. You're, you, the reaction time that you need, you can't go through one to eight in your head while the trick's moving at a, you know, you know, a thousand degrees a second. So yeah. then I came to that point. It's like, wait a second. 
if I just copy how it's supposed to look, like mm -hmm. you said, if you imagine, you mimic it, right? Can anyone tell the difference? And I realized nobody can tell the difference if I just do it by trying to copy what it's supposed to look like. And if I'm supposedly really understanding it. And yeah. that, that was the biggest game change. My gymnastics went through the roof as soon as I realized that pathway was so much faster and so much more efficient because the brain thinks in pictures, not words. Yeah. So you take a word, it's got to translate it to a picture and then the picture translated into the movement. Yeah. So if you just go to the movement and you can do it, that's the whole thing with the legs turning apart. I couldn't do it until I could, but I practiced with the movement. I think visualization, like most, I think people need to narrow it down, right? Yeah. Look at your mistake. You know, what are you visualizing? I'm doing a, you know, I want to do a body weight military press. I want to do a squat, deadlift, whatever. Where do you, where does it, where does the form break down? Yeah. Because if you don't know, like I was talking about that lifter, if you don't know where the form breaks down, you don't know what to fix. Mm -hmm. How can you go forward if you don't know what to fix? Then you're just kind of closing your eyes and hoping. Yeah. Hope is not a strategy, folks. Hope is not. A, well, <laughs> it's not a strategy at all. Um, one final question of the mm -hmm. list that I had sent you that I'm curious about, and this is particularly as it pertains to, I would say as it pertains to, uh, ballistic kettlebell ballistics, just because, um, you know, there's an explosive nature to it and there's a certain level of, you can't really think your way through it. You know, it's right. like, it's just going to happen. Uh, to what degree do a do you look for asymmetries in the boomers that you train when you're getting them ready for stuff like swings and other ballistics? I mean, is that an important thing or is it just sure. trying you know, to, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A asymmetry is the, 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 at the ground level of everything I'm looking at with clients, because I, I mean, I'm not in person and like most of my clients I've had for so long, I know their asymmetries and I know what we're to work on, but this is something I think most trainers don't know. And most people don't know is like, they don't know what the norms are like, okay, so what's normal dorsiflexion, right? Yeah. What's normal knee flexion? What's normal hip flexion? What's normal shoulder flexion, right? What's head rotation? What's norm? And what's yours? Okay, so my left shoulder goes here, my right shoulder goes there. That's going to be a big, and that's mine. <laughs> you know, it goes a little more, but it's it's not the same. So if I try to load it bilaterally, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. So if you have most of the time, you know, the problem is mainly with snatches or cleans, mainly snatches because it's overhead. Anything that goes overhead, most people's shoulder flexion is um, – really asymmetrical yeah it's just not a common thing to have anymore overhead most people can't keep their elbows straight overhead either so those people it's like i'm not going to push them on that skill mm -hmm. that goes back to i'm you know they're still going to do overhead stuff but it's going to be basically corrective stuff so i'm not going to load it I'm still yeah. going to train it in the sense of i'm going to put i'm going to work a pattern mm -hmm. but there's a big difference in you know working a pattern and loading a pattern yeah. So ballistics, uh, and I disagree with the idea that you, you know, uh, you can't, you, you can't think your way through ballistics, but you should have the progressions of the drills enough. So, you know, you don't go, you don't, um, you don't go blind in the middle of it. You don't yeah, yeah. forget where you are. And mm -hmm. if you do, you got to back up and find a drill that works that, you know, I still see people that are supposedly certified instructors can't do a damn clean correctly. And the clean bangs, it's like, come on, really? Yeah. You know, you can press this, that, or the other, but you can't, your belt, you can't clean it. Yeah. So the clean's probably one of the hardest. Now that's not a asymmetry issue. That's people forget how, or don't know how much athleticism, just doing anything with a kettlebell requires. Yeah. There's so much going on athletically balanced coordination kinesthetic sense that's one of the big turnarounds so but you know there's always a drill that will take a drill or a corrective exercise <clears throat> that will address that and again mainly it's going to be swings i mean mainly it's going to be snatches that could be problematic get ups it's the same thing with get ups you know it's like and i've never you know i i think get ups a good exercise i don't think it's the you know the holy grail that everybody makes it out to be. I don't, it's not even to me, it's not even a kettle. It has nothing to do with kettlebells. You could do a get up with anything, right? Yeah. Dumbbell, sandbag, human being, anything. So it's a great idea. I work get ups forever trying to 
use it because everybody told me it was going to fix my shoulder. Did nothing. Not not a not a month. And I owed a difference in my shoulder mobility. Yeah. So, but so get ups and snatches would be the ones that really, if you don't have good shoulder mobility, and that's well worth improving and working on. Yeah. But um some people that I found do really well, and by really meant well I mean don't get injured doing two hand swings and have a lot of trouble with one arm swings and vice versa. And I used to try to change them in one sense. I wanted everybody to be every, now I just like, okay, that's your swing. Like my swings, the one I'm swing. Mm -hmm. My body does not like two hand swings. I don't do them. So I have, I have training partners that, you know, one arm swings are okay at a certain weight it goes above a weight. They get hurt for whatever reason. Now, if you're like life goal is to do heavy one arm swings. Yeah. You can figure it out, but, for most people, it's just not worth it. Yeah. Um, and again, one of my favorite things, one of the things that comes up with Pavel's new axe program is the hand-to-hand -hand swings, mm -hmm. which I think is great because I've always said the, the transfer swings are the most pure form of swing. Yeah. You, uh, just hip driven. So that kind of takes care of asymmetry as well. I started doing those again on my light days. I'm loving it. So it's fun which is a word you almost never hear come out of my mouth. <laughs> Particularly not when it pertains to training, you know? Right. But it was like, I, like, I love my heavy swing day, but I would do my light swings after my light press day on Wednesdays. It was like I've done like an hour of pressing. It was the last thing I wanted to do a swing. Yeah. Uh, but then I started doing transfers. It was like, oh, this is, this is actually fun. It's enjoyable. It's Definitely. different. But I'm, so I'm saying it's the, as far as your question is the asymmetry for boomers, Everything goes back to that risk reward ratio. Yeah. If there's the slightest bit more risk than reward, I can it because there's so many possible things to do. Right. Of course. And you know, I'm not tied to they have to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. You know, like think, okay, look at double double bell swings. I you know, I got really short legs. If I I can do double, I can do decent double swings with 24s. As soon as it gets bigger. I got to go so wide. I it's like, it doesn't feel athletic at all to me. Yeah. So it's not my move, but some guys, you know, you got tall dudes with, you know, 34 inch inseam. It's like, these are easy. It's like, yeah, because yeah. you're six, three. Yeah. It's different. So I think the individuation is everything. Totally. And this is where I think some people make a mistake. A lot of people in our, in our niche anyway, they're, they're too focused on exercises and not mm -hmm. as focused on exercise. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know what? Maybe right. this person doesn't need to be a military pressing right now. There's no reason that you can't get them excited about doing push-ups, you know, or you know, other things like that. Push-ups to me is like, you know, if you can't, that's something, if you can't do any variation of push-up, that was my entry point back into pressing again was a yeah. primal move. Did you do primal move in, back in the early days? I did. Yeah. I mean, 2012, I took the original primal move, sir, with Peter up in Seattle. I realized like, I can't do a push up. My shoulder was so jacked. Yeah. I'm on the ground. I'm like, oh, I didn't know because I hadn't tried push ups forever. I could barely do a negative push up off my knees. Yeah. Like, okay, that's a clue. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, but so that, that to me is the, that's the one pattern. Well, I, I like I said, all the primal patterns, that's for my boomer people. They all do some variation of a push up. Yeah. Because that's the save your life, get off the floor thing. Absolutely. And when they fall, if they can shock absorb. So that nobody's, you know, it's the same thing with barbell squats. It's like I always just say, I've never heard in my life a, something fell out of the sky, landed on somebody's shoulder, and they had to squat and stand up. So or likewise a with a bench squat press. Was never, huh? Or likewise with a bench press, you know, like. Right. Oh. You know, and I'm a really good bench presser. I was always very good. And I've never, I've always said the worst exercise in the world for everybody is bench press. You yeah. will not go to any master's powerlifting meet and you get guys trying to comb their hair. Like, okay, they bench 800 pounds, but they uh, look at Ed Cohn. His shoulders are wrecked. Just going to mention him. Yeah. I saw a video maybe a year or so ago. He was at some PT or whatever. And they were doing, they literally had like a chisel to try oh, to yeah. go high tech. <laughs> no, the hammer. The yeah. Hammer. Oh my God. Those videos are like, yeah. But I mean, that's what bench pressing does. Cause it takes your scapula out. Yeah. You know, I, I, I hurt my shoulders benching twice and I was like, you know what? I've gone far enough. I don't really care anymore. You know, it's, yeah, just... it's the same as deadlift. It's good to have done a certain level if you're young, 
but you know, you, when you start keep, when you start pushing it, everybody gets hurt. Everybody yeah. gets hurt. Yeah. So I hit that. my, I hit my PR. I hit a, it was a broomstick with a bagel on each end. And I was nice. like, this is far enough. What yeah. kind of bagel? Everything bagel. So it was everything. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite. Right. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, so Riff, where can people follow you online if they, uh, they want to follow your training, they want to watch what you're up to and, uh, all well, that if they stuff. really want to follow my training, it's riffs, riffs, blog dot blogspot dot com. Mm -hmm. I'm shocked that Google still supports it. It's still up, but that's yeah. where, I mean, I literally write everything down in detail. So that's, if you're interested in my actual training, what goes on and get 20 years of archives, mm -hmm. all the videos, you know, I put up one video on Facebook or whatever, all the archives are there. Facebook, obviously I, I have a little bit of training one there youtube channel all my videos go if you you know want that they all go up there just no comments yeah. <laughs> turn comments off um instagram once in a while mostly my dogs but basically training is is the blog and then facebook great and then you know i've got my website which is like that website's almost as old as the as the uh the blog so <laughs> It's there's not there's not it's a catalog brochure for my training, but it's not much training information there. Right on. Good. So, folks, I highly recommend that you check out Riff's blog, Riff's blog at blogs, uh, dot blogspot dot, dot no, com. Blog dot blogspot dot com. Yep. Riff's blog dot blogspot dot com. Check them out on Facebook. Uh, Mark, it has been a pleasure once again. Thank you. For always. Thanks for having me, Alex. Of Anytime course. you want to talk, I'm glad to do it. Absolutely. And folks, as always, have fun and happy training.